We doing good? <laughs> that was so fake. All right. <laughs> you got to love Spring Forward Sunday, man. I, this is what I've been telling people, all right? So our first worship gathering is 815. They all got extra bonus points in heaven. It's biblical, and it, I tell them that every year, okay? Um, next hour will make me laugh, and, and it's just, it's funny this week, every year. Next hour will make me laugh because um, we'll have people who are late to third hour. And, 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 I want, and, I, and there, there's going to be people that this, I mean, they're not going to show up at 1130. They're going to show up at like 1230. And there's not going to be anybody here. And they're going to think like God came back. And it's going to be awesome. Everything will mess with them. And uh, you should just stick around to watch it. But it's, uh, it's a good Sunday. Hey, here's the deal. We're going to be in Acts uh, chapter 9 today. Acts chapter 9. So if you have a, a mobile device or a Bible and you want to look that up, you can look up Acts chapter 9. Also, I want to say this while we're turning there. Uh, we had a great crew of students go to Tulsa this weekend uh, for what we call Super Start with Christ and Youth and uh, took a whole uh, bus full of kids. And, and man, uh, on, again, time change weekend and everything else, I just want to say thank you to all our, our youth staff and volunteers, leaders, parents that, that went up there this weekend and, and did that 24-hour jaunt. Man, it is it's an awesome, powerful trip, but it is a lot of work, too, and they just crushed it. And uh, I'm just really, really thankful for those of you who are a part of our, our youth ministry team and volunteer in that ministry. We could not have what we have without you. So thank you. All right, let me do this. Let me pray, and then we'll jump into Acts chapter 9. Let's pray. God, you're good, and as we jump into your word today, would you just speak to us through your word? And Father, we're here not just to... Not just to observe, Father, we want you to do something in us that would, would leave us changed. And Father, may we respond in a way that would honor you and, and Father, in a way that would cause us to literally live differently. And so speak to us through your word today. Thank you for your, your, your scriptures. And we just pray that it would absolutely transform our hearts and minds. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we've been studying the book of Acts, and we've been uh, kind of walking through each chapter. I want you to know this, especially if you're jumping on board with us uh, new today. Um, once you get to chapter 9, it kind of takes a shift a little bit in the story of this new church and what God's doing after Jesus has ascended back to heaven in launching this New Testament church. So we've been talking a lot about the Holy Spirit in the first eight chapters, and certainly the Holy Spirit is uh, continued to be talked about throughout the book of Acts. But when you get to Acts chapter 9, we read about the conversion of Saul. And so some of you, maybe you, you've been in church a long time and you know about Saul's story, but I'm telling you, this story today is powerful. And I would love for you to, to maybe look at it even with fresh ears or fresh eyes today. What we read in Acts chapter 9 is that things are getting to a tipping point with this new church. In fact, what's happening is there's a revolution taking place. And we find ourselves reading about a movement that is taking place among God's people. We read about men and women who are dedicated followers. We read about a guy named Saul whose whole life was shifted from being a leader to being a follower, right? Being a, uh, you don't hear this advertised very often. Uh, you, you, you hear a lot about being a great leader. You often don't hear things about being a great follower. But today in Acts chapter 9, we're going to learn what it looks like to be a great follower. A lot of times when we think about living spiritual lives, our minds go to leading something big. But the revolution we read about in Acts started small, and it was more about following. And we aren't good followers, you know what I mean? Uh, we, when we talk of following Jesus, usually you're, you're thinking, maybe I'm thinking of some significant way we can have a mark on the people around us. But what we see about the book of Acts is that it started small. Hope City is a young church, and, and it, it has grown. It's certainly growing, but it started small. I can remember literally meeting with about 10 men before we ever launched our first service in a little conference room on the second floor of a building that we met. And I remember meeting with those guys, and we were doing this Bible study. And the reality is that any movement of God, any work that God does, usually starts with kind of a small group. And we've seen stories, and maybe you've watched the movies, but uh, 
you know, I, I remember the, the movie that when it came out about Steve Jobs. You know what I'm talking about? Maybe you saw that movie. It started, uh, or it talked about how Apple started. And it was almost hard to believe that a product that would change the world started in someone's house. You know what I mean? But we've seen the end result, and you just find yourself amazed. And, and, it, and it's happened several times. Uh, Amazon. Did you know Amazon started in the garage of a, a home in Bellevue, Washington? How hard is that to believe, right? The highest grossing media conglomerate in the world all started in a one-car garage that belonged to Walt Disney's uncle, Robert Disney. Uncle Bob. That's where it came from. I, I like this one. Nike started out of founder Phil Knight's green Plymouth Valiance trunk. You know? And the greater lesson may not be about the leadership of organizations like that. It may be about how they began. That, that's what Acts seems to be teaching us. How to lead a movement. How to lead a movement. How to be a follower in a movement that Jesus is leading. And maybe you're like me and you need to be a better follower. We don't teach much on following in our culture, but what we read in Acts chapter 9 is it's vital. Many of you are, are familiar with TED Talks and, and maybe you've watched a bunch of them or, or certainly you've seen maybe one or two. But they're short talks that are given on various topics that pertain to the marketplace or, or the business world or even culture. And a, a guy named Derek Sievers did a, a TED Talk that I've loved for a long time and I've just kind of I've, I've held on to. It's bookmarked in my in my safari window. And the presentation he gave was called How to Start a Movement. And it wasn't about how to be a leader, but the impact of following. That was the, the, whole, the whole talk was about the impact of following. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's not about following Jesus, this, this, this clip is it, but it has implications nonetheless of what it looks like to follow. And it's humorous. He, he affectionately called it Lessons from a Shirtless Guy Who's Dancing. And, and, and I want to do this. I want you to watch this. And I'm going to read his narration of the clip, all right? Leadership lessons from a shirtless guy dancing on how to make a movement. And in this video, he's, he's under three minutes, this guy's going to dissect for us some lessons, all right? A leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional, and that is key. You must be able to be followed. So now... now now comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone how to follow. Notice the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. And notice he's calling to his friends to join in. It takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and brave ridicule yourself. Uh, being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. I love that. The first follower transforms a lone dancer into a leader. And if the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that makes the fire. He goes on, he says, the second follower is a turning point. It's proof the first one has done well. And now it's not a, a lone nut. It's, it's, it's not two nuts. There's a crowd, and crowd is a party. And a movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. And everyone needs to see the followers because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. So, so now here comes two more, then three, and and then you get momentum, and he says, this is the tipping point. Now you get a movement. And as more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join now. They, they won't uh, be ridiculed. They won't stand out, and they'll be part of the in crowd, right, if they hurry. Over the next minute, you, you see the rest who prefer to be part of the crowd, but because they'd eventually be ridiculed for not joining, and he says, and ladies and gentlemen, that's how a movement is made. He said, let's recap. If you're a version of the shirtless dancing guy all alone, remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. He says, be public, be easy to follow. He said, but the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over glorified. Yet it started with this shirtless guy, and he'll get all the credit. What you saw happen was the first follower that transformed a lone dancer into a leader. He says there's no movement without the first follower. And we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone dancer doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and jump in. I love it. Uh, Sivers may not realize that, that this uh, really is describing what happened to, in, in a sense to the early church. 
What he shared was not a new concept, but he's identifying elements that are noticeable in any movement. When you think of the book of Acts and what's taking place, Jesus led the way. He faced ridicule and mockery and eventually death in order to be the courageous servant leader that we so desperately needed, right? The disciples became the first followers, and Christianity had begun spreading throughout the Jewish communities. And finally, one of the incredible elements of this revolution is that it didn't lose its identity. When we read what's happening in Acts, there was a significant substance in who the early church was, and it kept them rooted in why they were willing to, to, to literally sacrifice so much for the sake of Christ. One of the most significant factors of the revolution that took place in the book of Acts was what in Silver, or Siever's uh, notes uh, in his presentation, he says, it started with a few bold followers. There was no, no difference in what took place in Acts. It started through followers like Peter and John and like Mary and Martha, people like Philip and Stephen. It started in the lives of individuals and, and people who were no longer willing to live life without purpose and meaning and had discovered the reason for their whole existence. I don't know about you, but when I read the book of Acts and I read about a revolution, that sounds like something I want to be part of. Here's the definition. A revolution is a sudden, extreme, or complete change in the way people interact, work, and live. In other words, if you signed up to follow Jesus and you weren't interested in changing anything, you signed up for the wrong revolution. You know what I mean? In fact, here's what we know. You can't join the revolution without being a bold follower. Someone once said, if you desire true revival in your family, your church, and your community, then what you can do is you can draw a circle on the ground. You can step into that circle, pray for everyone in that circle. And when everyone in that circle has experienced revival, you'll see revival. In other words, revival starts with you. You see, week in and week out, we have men and women who walk into churches all over the country, including this one, who carry with them sin and hurt and guilt and the burden of their past and even current regrets, and they believe they have been dismissed by God. That it's impossible for them to be a follower, let alone a follower that can have an impact on the world around them. And that's why Acts chapter 9 is so important for us to hear this morning. We, we have friends uh, that, that have this ministry in the Dominican it's called Go Ministries. In fact, we've got some high schoolers that are heading there uh, here on spring break. Uh, they're going to be taking a group down. And I love hearing from my friend Tim. I was riding in a van with him one time when we were in Santiago. I first went um, on a mission trip to the Dominican several years ago, and we worked with uh, another friend of mine in, in Monte Cristi. But then uh, we, we met, had this relationship, met these folks in Santiago, and, and started partnering with them as well. And, and Tim is one of the guys who's been on the ground there forever. And, and I was riding in a van with Tim, and we were riding around San, uh, Santiago. And, and I said, hey, Tim, you got to tell me, like, what's your strategy? What's your strategy for reaching this city? Santiago is a huge city. So what's your strategy? And he said, well, it's simple. I was surprised to hear him say that. He said, it's simple. Here's what we do. We will find the person in our community that is least likely to ever be associated with Jesus, who everybody knows, and we'll go win them to God. And I thought, that, that is a, a pretty simple strategy. So, so, so why? What, I mean, obviously that's important. But why? He said, because when people see someone follow Jesus, especially someone who before is only following the world, it has this incredible impact. Their goal was to find the one person in the community who was so lost the community would be stunned if they began to follow Jesus and they wanted to go after that person. So that's how I ended up with this box of cigars. Uh, yeah, you didn't know we could do that in church, but you didn't know a pastor could have cigars. Uh, so, so this, this, uh, the brand of this cigar is called Crossfire. I want to tell you the story about this specific box of cigars, um, and, and, I, and I've hung on to the box just for this reason. But I was down there uh, at one point with the executive director of the ministry. His name's Brooke, and, and I said, "Hey, Brooke, um, Tim, Tim was telling me that one of your strategies in reaching Santiago and the and, and the city for Jesus is that you're going to go after people in the community that everybody knows who are the furthest people from God, and then you're going to." You're going to share the hope of Jesus with them. And when they become a follower of Jesus, everybody's going to take note. And, and that's, that's one of your evangelism strategies, right? And he said, yeah. And I said, so tell me, like, how, like, give me an example of how this has worked. And he goes, I'll tell you what, we'll go to dinner tonight, and I'll tell you all about it. And I'm like, all right, this is cool. And he said, here's the, here's the deal, though. We need to wear some nice clothes. Well, I mean, I just had some stuff crammed into a bag, so I, I was, you know, trying to iron some things for that evening. We go to this really nice Restaurant. There's about eight of us, but about, about six in our group, and we meet two guys there. One of the guys his, that, that we meet, his name is William Ventura. 
And he walks in, and, and he, we weren't prepped before this, but he, he walks in, and when he walks in, uh, one, he's like dressed to the nines, but he, but he walks in and everybody kind of looks at him and stares at him. You could just tell when somebody walks in the room and they've got this like um, uh, prestige or power or uh, influence, and he walks into the room, and he's a very uh, humble guy, meek guy, but he walks into the room and he gives Brooke a hug and we sit down to eat dinner. He didn't speak English, he could understand it, but he didn't speak it, and so Brooke served as the interpreter for the evening, and as we sat down to have dinner, Brooke began to tell the story about him and William and how they met, and William spent most of that time listening as Brooke talked about how what he wanted to do was build some relationships in Santiago, and so he went and he met William. Now, if, if, if you're not a uh, cigar person, this may mean nothing, but you're just going to have to trust me on this, okay? William, at the, at the time that Brooke met him, was the maestro for a, a blending maestro for a, a, a cigar company called Davidoff, which is one of the, uh, it's, it's known worldwide as one of the, the best cigars that, that you can buy. And, and what a cigar maestro is, is it's like the head chef. They're like the cook, and so they blend the tobacco that goes into the cigar, and only the maestro knows, like, the blend, right? It's like his secret, and he knew this, and so he was a very valuable person in the Dominican because the Dominican, the economy there is, cigars is a huge export. It's a huge part of the economy, so everybody knew William Ventura, and so he stepped away from Davidoff to start basically his own company, and as the maestro of Davidoff already had a big name. So Brooke introduces himself to him. That's how they meet, and Brooke's telling us this story, and he says, this is William, and, and here's how uh, I got to, to know William. And he said, finally, I started asking William, William, I want you to teach me everything you know about cigars. And as, he's, as Brooke is telling us this, we, we, we look over, and William's just kind of chuckling. He's kind of smiling like, you know, yeah, that wasn't going to happen. You know, like, because, if, if, you know, a cook, you don't give away, like, your, your best recipes, your best kept secrets, right? And so he, he says, you know, he's, he's kind of chuckling, and he's laughing at Brooke. And Brooke says, so we just kept building a relationship, building a relationship. And I kept say, saying, hey, uh, William, you, you got to tell me everything you know about cigars. He said, one night we had dinner, and before I left, I asked him again. I said, hey, William, tell me everything you know about cigars. And he said, William looked at me after a while of building a relationship and a a pretty good friendship. And at this point, they, they both, you could tell there was a lot of motion in, in the air. And he said, William looked at me and he said, I tell you what, Brooke, I'll tell you everything I know about cigars is if you tell me everything you know about Jesus. And, and they, 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 they struck up this incredible, incredible friendship. And, and they're telling us this story. And then Brooke goes on to say, hey, here's, here's something kind of wild. He said, if you work as a, as a roller in these cigar factories, it's kind of faux pas there to, to go into a church. In fact, they see that as very much uh, something that, that you shouldn't be doing. And, and churches are very hesitant to just welcome in people who work in the cigar factories. He said, so I talked to William, and, and we talked about what it would look like if we on Sundays when the cigar factory was closed, just decided to plant a church in one of the cigar factories so that all the workers in the cigar factory could come and attend church in a cigar factory where they would feel welcome. In fact, here's, uh, here's us. We're, we're actually in one of the rooms where the, the dehumidifiers is. You didn't know we could do this in church, right? We, we were, were standing literally in William's mission field, so to speak. And here, here's a picture of, of me and William at his house. And... We have the same haircut, you know, and, uh, and, and, and just to see, see this man who has a ton of influence, go, you know what, I've led a lot of stuff, but I think I need to follow. I think I need to follow. A revolution is often started with, with one man who's willing to allow Jesus to do the impossible in his or her life. But let's do this. Let's read this conversion of Saul in Acts chapter 9, verse 1. It says this. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Now, don't just read this and blow past it because here's the deal. In Psalm 80, it uses the same phrase. And you know how the English translates it in Psalm chapter 80? It translates it like a boar in a vineyard. Like a wild boar in a vineyard. I mean, so when he's breathing, I mean, he is literally working to destroy the church. It says, he went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any, any there who belonged to the way, right, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. And then it goes on and it says this. As he neared Damascus on his journey, this would have been about a week's journey. 
Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? In verse five it says this, who are you, Lord, Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do next. And it says in verse seven and eight, the men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. It says in verse 8 and 9 that Saul got up from the ground. But when, the, when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they, they led him by the hand into Damascus. And for three days he was blind and he did not eat or drink anything. Now, now hear this. One of the things you take away from this passage is this. Because some of you are in this situation this morning, okay? God's plan includes even those who oppose him. He, he's not afraid of your mess. He's not afraid of even your past. He is going after the man who is persecuting the very people who are claiming Jesus is God. And God should have given up on Saul, right? He, he, he doesn't, though. He looks at Saul and he says, Saul, the revolution, Saul, it's for you too. And this is huge because if you've ever felt on the outside of God's plan... This is proof that he is inviting even you in. There's no greater enemy to the follower of Jesus than Saul that we read about, and yet God intervenes in an unmistakable way. All right, so let's keep reading. We'll read the next eight verses. We'll read verse 10 through 18. It says this. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias, and the Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. That's a statement, right? It says, in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. God's intervening in all kinds of ways right now. And it says, Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he's done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he's come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. This is Ananias' way of saying, hey, God, real quick, wrong person. <laughs> you have the wrong person. Send me to somebody else. This guy's going to kill me. And he goes on. It says, but the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. Wow, what a statement. So I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. It says, then Ananias went to the house. By the way, isn't it interesting? Ananias begins to question God and what's God say? So if you're an underliner or a circler or a highlighter, if you like to mark stuff or write stuff down, this is an easy one. God says, go. And Ananias, go. And Ananias like, and is like, man, this is risky. Like, God, what you're asking me to do, like this is, are you, go. And then I love it because Ananias, in his faithfulness to the Lord, it says Ananias went to the house and he entered it. And placing his hands on Saul, he said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road. By the way, I'm sorry, we just can't rush through this. Ananias walks in. Literally two chapters before this, Saul has just murdered Stephen. And Ananias walks in and he says, Brother Saul. He hasn't even heard from Saul yet. In faithfulness of understanding, this is what God's doing. He says, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then it says this in 18 and 19. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and he was baptized. Now hear me out, church. It's often during times of uncertainty when God calls us to follow him in ways that are risky. And you can apply that to Saul or you can apply that to Ananias. We saw it all throughout the Old Testament. Daniel in the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the life of Moses. Moses wasn't even supposed to live. There was an edict that Pharaoh had declared that all Hebrew babies be put to death, and yet Moses followed the Lord's leading, didn't he? What's this mean for you and me? If you choose to be a part of the revolution, it means we have to understand that we are fighting a battle in which we must follow 
Christ over following man. And there are people who don't want your family to succeed. There are people who don't want this church to succeed. I promise you this, if you join the revolution and allow God to begin to overhaul your life, you will face opposition. You're going to face opposition at work. You're going to face opposition at home. Sinful desires will oppose you. And if we want to win the battles that are before us, we have to follow him daily. I'm not sure if you've heard the name Liz Curtis Higgs before. She was a best-selling New York Times author, and her most famous book came out a while back, and it was called Bad Girls of the Bible, which I'm like, what a cool name for a book, you know? And, and she tells a story about how she was five years into her broadcasting career working at the same radio station as Howard Stern as a feminist voice in this shock jock arena. In fact, <laughs> the way she tells the story, one day Howard Stern walks by Liz and she's actually doing a line of coke at her desk, and he walks by, and Howard Stern says, Liz, you need to clean your life up. Can you imagine being corrected by Howard Stern on living the way you're living? Liz tells a story about how a, a woman befriended her, and and she loved her and cared about her like no one else had. And eventually, as they became closer, the woman invited her to actually the, the church that Rachel and I were on staff at before we came and planted Hope City. And she goes on to say that she finally gave in to, to visiting one Sunday. She had resisted, but this woman was so good to her, she finally just kind of buckled and gave in. And she said, uh, she said, I, I admittingly, went in skeptical. I was ready as I sat in the crowd to rip apart whatever the preacher had to say. She said, I was, I was guns a-blazing that day. I mean, again, she was this, this feminist shock jock and known for being crass, and she's sitting in a church. And sure enough, check this out, the topic that, the, that, that day that the preacher preached on was men loving their wives and wives submitting to their husbands. Have you ever done that, by the way? Have you ever invited somebody to church and you sat down and you're like, dude, this is the worst topic that we could be talking about today. So she sits down. She says, she sat there and she listened and she wept. And she began to experience God in a way in which she knew he was real. Church, listen, the ripple effects of what happens in the life of Saul reaches all the way to the seat that Liz Curtis Higgs sat in that day. And it reaches all the way to the seat that you're sitting in right now. You see, the, the reality of what's happening is God is using the least likely people to build the movement on. The revolution is not built on the most athletic person. It's not built on the most um, uh, uh, voted likely to succeed person. It's not built on the smartest person in the room. It's not built on the person who's proven themselves in their line of work or profession. It was built on a murderous man who was doing everything he could to stamp out the name of Jesus. Do you realize the impact of this? Jesus is not just letting liars, thieves, and murderers be a part of the movement. No, if they are willing to follow him, he's using their stories as the face of the movement. He is intersecting their life and turning their belief system upside down, and he's using it to magnify his glorious grace. So we get to Acts 9, 19, and listen to what happens. This is awesome. It says, and after taking some food... Saul, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. What do you think those days went like? We don't talk about this verse much, but can you imagine? Saul had just killed Stephen not long before this, and now he's hanging out with the disciples in Damascus who were running from Saul. And I wish we could just push pause and ask Luke, hey, Luke, can you give us a little bit more detail here? You left out some stuff. Because that, that conversation had to be fascinating. Saul's trying to explain to the Christians that he was there to join them instead of kill them. And I like that the text says that he spent several days with them. Now, now check this out. Because Saul knew, Saul knew the word of God probably better than they did. In fact, what we read about Saul is he was one of the most well-versed people in Scripture. He even says this about himself. He said, I, I, knew, I knew all the laws. He was schooled in the scriptures. 
but he was just learning about Jesus. And here's what I wonder. I wonder if his time with those disciples, I wonder if, I wonder if for Saul it was him working out some of his own past. Do you know as he sat with them, there had to be an immense feeling of processing and wrestling with the reality that he had not only killed their best friend, but now was trying to live a life that would follow Jesus. And he was literally persecuting those who were doing the same. I want to do this. I want to jump down a few verses to verse 26. It says this. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him. <laughs> Wouldn't you be? They didn't believe he was really a disciple. So he comes back to Jerusalem. I mean, if I was a disciple, I would be looking at it like this. Hey, if there was a really good way for Saul to get into our inner workings and find out who's involved in all this and then lock all of us up or kill us, it would be to go, hey, I'm a disciple now. And they're... They're navigating this, and we read about the boldness of what Barnabas does. I'm telling you, this is just one person after another who goes, you know what, I'll follow Jesus in this. And the boldness of Barnabas starts in verse 27, and we'll read through verse 29. It says, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, and he told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. And in verse 28 and 29 it says, so Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, which were the Jews that were from Jerusalem, it says, but they tried to kill him. Now he is on the other side of the table. So where do we land with Acts 9? Well, I, I want you to see this. There's two keys to the revolution that we read about in Acts 9, and, and, and if we aren't careful, we'll miss it. And this may seem really simple, but listen to me, church. I think if we do these two things, we're, we're going to see God do amazing things among us. The first key to the revolution is this. Saul embraced his story of brokenness. Why do you think he sat with them in Damascus and then sat and spent time with them in Jerusalem? Everybody knew what Saul had done. It wasn't a secret. Jesus had taken the most unlikely person in the community. And if they were to get saved, everybody would know about it. And he did it with Saul. He did it. I don't know how you view your story. Just a, a heads up. Um, none of us have stories that are squeaky clean. I know, shocker. We all have a past. There are times when I don't even want to look into my past because I'm still broken hearted by some of the things that I've done in my life. There's things that I wish I could take back or do again or, or have a do over. And, and yet at the same time, what happens in our lives, because some of you, you know, like even as I say, man, my past, you start thinking about your past and some of the brokenness that you've experienced and we try to hide it. Like, well, I just, I, what, what I'll do is I'll just stuff that way back there and I'll just try to, but, but listen, it doesn't go away. Even if you're forgiven by Jesus, your past doesn't get erased. It's, it's not like you can just turn it off or forget it, right? But it does get redeemed. And so what we find in Saul's story and how his witness became so powerful is Saul now because of his past being redeemed by Jesus is speaking and preaching and teaching the good news. Here's the second thing. Second key is the church embraced Saul's story of brokenness. We have to embrace story of brokenness because it's what highlights redemption. Ananias and Barnabas were the two that helped Saul find community in the early church. And if it wasn't for them, we don't know who the light bearer might have been. They were advocates for a man who everybody else had hesitations about. Here's a question. You know there are people, some in your family, some in your workplace, some in your community, that have hesitations about whether or not they would be accepted into a community of believers. And, and the question is this. 
What if you're the Barnabas? Like, what if you're the Ananias? What if you're the one who is going to advocate for them? Uh, Liz Curtis Higgs writes these words in her book. She says, at my low point, leaning over my pit of despair and extending a hand of friendship was a husband and wife radio team who just arrived in town to do the morning show at my station. She said, although they'd enjoyed much worldly success, what these two talked about most was Jesus Christ. She said, even more surprising, they seemed to, to like and accept me as is. Can you imagine, she says, what they must have thought when, when we met? She said, they probably thought, now here's a project. She said, but they didn't treat me like a project. They treated me like a friend who needed to hear some seriously good news. Simply put, they loved me with a love so compelling that I was powerless to resist it. She said, I remember February 21st, 1982, like it was yesterday. It was my seventh Sunday to visit my friend's church. And by then, she said, I was singing in the choir. She said, when we closed the service singing, this song, I have decided to follow Jesus. She said, I walked out of the choir loft and down to the baptistry ready to make my confession of faith. She said, the whole alto section gasped. We thought she was one of us. <laughs> And she says, finally, I was. She said, thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord Jesus. Church family, listen. As we look at the early church, we see some incredible truths. And the greatest impact that you will make for the kingdom is to brace your story and become a follower of him. If you're here this morning and you'd be like, man, I, I'm just not good at following. Can I give you a line that will help you reconcile your past with the, redeem, with the redeeming grace and mercy of Jesus? It's something like this. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. We read this story and I think we read about a God whose love knows no boundaries. When God redeems our past, he doesn't erase it. It's still there. Everywhere Saul went, his past was known. But he redeems it because it becomes evident that without God, you'd be stuck in the past. But thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have redeemed and restored what was once broken. Let me pray for us, all right? God, we thank you today. We thank you because... Our reality is that without your redeeming love, without your grace in our lives, without you intervening, uh, Father, we would be stuck in our past. And I, I just pray today, I pray for those who don't know your redeeming grace, they don't know your salvation, Father, that they might find that in you. And God, I pray for those this morning who, for some reason, we, you know, we, in, in shame and guilt, we have found ourselves hiding our past. God, may we begin to embrace our story in a way that sheds light on your goodness and glory and grace. God, that you are in the business of restoration. And as we do that, may we walk alongside others as we follow you. May we walk alongside those who are hurting and broken and and point them to the one who can lead them to hope and new life. We love you. We thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice and your resurrection so that we could have new life. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.